Welcome to the Nanovation Podcast. Information about this and other episodes can be found at fillerlab.com forward slash nanovation. If you like what you hear, be sure to tell a friend or leave a review at Apple Podcasts. It really does help. I welcome your thoughts and suggestions. You can contact me on Twitter at Michael Filler or via email at nanovationpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you to the Chi Foundation for their generous financial support. The material itself is a crystalline solid of yummy, delicious chocolate, uh, wax crystals, basically, and, and other, you know, and, and, and other components. And, you know, the, the property of that is that it's a solid at room temperature, but you put it in your mouth and it melts. That's Eric First from the University of Delaware. He's an expert in self-assembly, the Harry Potter-esque ability of materials to assemble themselves into well-defined structures. We talk about where we are, where we're going, and what makes controlling this process so difficult. Along the way, a variety of different topics make cameos, including M&Ms, NASA's Vomit Comet, flying solar cells, and more. Eric has a real knack for making esoteric topics engaging and fun. I hope you have as much fun listening to this episode as we had recording it. This is the Nanovation Podcast, an exploration of big innovations emerging from small things. I'm Mike Filler, your host and a professor at the Georgia Institute of Technology. Enjoy the show. Today I have Eric First, uh, Professor of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering at the University of Delaware, uh, joining. Thank you for uh, taking a few minutes to come on the podcast. Great pleasure, Michael. Uh, you are the Director of the Center for Molecular Engineering Thermodynamics. And uh, before you tell us what that is, I'll, I'll let you know that I tell my students uh, in the Intro to Chemie class that there's like three people in the world who really, truly understand thermodynamics. And who are they? <laughs> uh, I was thinking Atkins, who writes the physical chemistry textbook. Uh, and uh, I don't know who else, actually. My colleague, my my colleague, Stan Sandler, I have to nominate as one of the top three. And, you know, the the number of times he cites John Prowseness, I think, is also significant. Okay. okay. <laughs> Living thermodynamicist. <laughs> yeah. No, that's right. That's right. It, it, I find it hard to... It, it, to undergrads to explain, uh, but I think it's important that they recognize when thermodynamics was developed, why it was developed. But in a sense, it's hard. It's such a long time ago. And to think, what 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 was engineering like uh, before even thermodynamics existed or we understood it, right? It's a phenomenal subject to talk to students about. And it ties in with so many things that they think about in terms of the world around them that they're not always aware of it. Um, there's a very, there's a very difficult pedagogical exercise in this, right? In terms of how do you learn and how do you teach thermodynamics? It's pretty esoteric. Um, and the way we start off in our curriculum is to really just get an engineer's perspective about the types of problems that you're going to solve. And, uh, for the basic thermodynamics problems, it's exactly why it was invented in the 19th century. It's taking heat, a uh, degraded form of energy, and creating useful work out of that. Uh, and, you know, the types of problems that are involved with that, you know, are going to, uh, and, and how you do those calculations, that, right, that's going to dictate how you, how you can produce that work, you know, what the sources are going to be. And, and, you know, for us, that's high energy density fossil fuels oftentimes, nuclear reactors and energy production through electric, electrical generation, that sort of thing. Those are the types of problems and that you get into the thermodynamic functions and you start to build an intuition, just how do you use these, right? So this, we don't worry about, you know, what is entropy? It's so much, right? right? It's it's a state function. If I if I specify in a single component, you know, material to other of my thermodynamic variables, it's defined, and I can tell you that number, <laughs> right? And so, and you know, so that's it. And, and and the mystery of it, you know, we just know it has to be there because the thir the first law only works in one direction, and you can right. tap into intuition with that and that sort of thing. Um, and then the second course, you know, starts to get into mixture, starts to get into the, the separation processes that chemical engineers are so renowned for, um, you know, and, and then the activity coefficients and all the, all the wonderful, really esoteric of it starts to, yeah. <laughs> it starts to well, the, happen. The, the, the thing that I, I've always find challenging about thermo, uh, 
both when learning it and teaching it, is there's this piece that you're talking about. There's these really important problems you can solve using thermodynamics. Uh, and that's kind of the top-down perspective. But when I want to try and understand what enthalpy is or what entropy is, I find personally that uh, the statistical mechanics approach, the building up of these functions from thinking about collections of molecules and how they move and rotate and vibrate and those kinds of things, and, and that by summing all this up, all these little energies for all the molecules in a box, I can get these thermodynamic functions. So I find that the the problems I can solve are, are a bit disconnected, or at least I need to think about them differently than what the function, the the parameter, the value is. If that if that makes sense. Oh yeah, no, I totally agree with you. And it's a chicken and egg problem when it comes to thermodynamics. In fact, you only appreciate it after you know it, and you only start learning <laughs> it once 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 you know it. So yeah. you know, so then you can go in circles with is it the molecular, or the macroscopic, right, and right. you just it's it becomes a lifelong experience of lear- learning thermodynamics in my in my mind. <laughs> but it's also a heart of self assembly, which is something that we're going to talk about today. So um, we harness those thermodynamics in so many different ways. Uh, you know, and, and, and one of those ways is, uh, uh, the fact that systems find, uh, some thermodynamic minima and that can represent structure, uh, in a material, right? And so that's, that's what's, that's what's guiding our, uh, ideas of self-assembly. Okay. Great segue. Uh, you're a, a natural at this. So let's, <laughs> let's, let's talk about self-assembly, but not quite yet. So, um, okay. Sounds good. Uh, we'll come back to that. But so I invited Eric on to, to talk about, um, what I'll call the bottom up or additive or assembly of materials. And, uh, so what I'd like you to do to start off the conversation, Eric, is kind of just explain the difference between what someone would call top down or subtractive manufacturing and bottom up or additive manufacturing. Right, uh, a top-down process. I, I imagine the processes and, and the technologies that we have uh, due to these types of manufacturing processes. So the the, the one that comes to mind immediately uh, is the semiconductor processing industry, something I, I think that you uh, know very very well. Um, and you know the the ability that, that we've created and as engineers and scientists to build very complex structures, now nanoscale structures by adding and removing layers one at a time, right, to build up a, build up a structure, right, by photomasking, etching, depositing, et cetera, um, we can, we can create really sophisticated structures that way. And, and, and for me, those, those are nanoscale structures, right? They, they, they they move charge around, so they move electrons around in some sophisticated way that allows us to do computations, right? Um, store bits of information, et cetera. But it's a top-down process, right? You start with a, a wafer of a pure material, silicon or some other semiconductor, uh, and, and you're, and you're going through these different additive and subtractive steps in order to build up that structure. If we could design nanoscale structures in a way, or we could create those nanoscale structures where they formed themselves, like little Lego blocks just coming together spontaneously to build that structure, that would represent a self-assembly process. Uh, and so that's what I think of as sort of this bottom-up self-assembly uh, uh, method in terms of creating sort of nanoscale structures and new materials. Um, and there's there's going to be strengths and limits to that. And one of the key limitations right now is just you'll never build a computer that way at this point, right? But you can still <laughs> build pretty sophisticated nan- nanostructures that control how energy is going to propagate through a material, how, um, you know, it could be electrical, it could be light, it could be heat energy, how chemical species will propagate through materials. So is it a, something that separates chemical species, so, uh, et cetera. Um, those, those are, those are in my mind sort of the targets and, and sort of what differentiates that method of, uh, creating structures in terms of sort of bottom up versus top down. Yeah. And so, I think there's a couple things that are, are worth mentioning, right? So one of the, the great things about self-assembly is there's not a whole bunch of stuff you throw out. Or in theory, you know, if you do it well, you make only what you want, right? So for scale, like things where you need to produce a, a ton of stuff, you don't want to throw out a ton of stuff at the same time, right? You don't have to throw out the stuff you subtracted. So there's a lot of economic benefit that would come from this kind of approach if one could do it. 
Um, and there's different structures you could make too, right? So that's something that's important to mention, I think, that you get, you don't, well, there are oftentimes things that you can't make top down, but you could make bottom up if you could control the process well enough. So I think that's a really neat thing to, to hit on, actually. And it's, when I think about self-assembly, okay, so I'm thinking about small building blocks, maybe at a molecular scale, um, certainly in the polymers community, that's something that, that, that is quite, um, you know, that, that, that's uh, taken advantage of uh, a lot. Um, nanoparticles, colloidal particles, tiny pieces of matter, right? The idea is mm -hmm. that they will spontaneously form a structure under the right conditions, and that's driven by thermodynamics. The, the thing that I can harness then, and what I'm harnessing for nanotechnology, is really a scalable means of, of creating those structures. Because they, because they assemble themselves, right? I don't have to control a wafer and take it through different processes, you know, one by one. I have coding processes, perhaps. So I have a scalability in both the speed and perhaps area or, you know, volume. Uh, that I can, that I can create, uh, that I couldn't otherwise do. And so, you know, I think that's one of the key things in terms of there's, there's a hand in not just what you can, what you may be able to build in terms of functional properties of materials, but also the scalability of the manufacturing that could accompany that. And as, and, and with that also driving down costs of, you know, high, you know, high performance nanomaterial types of things, um, you know, that, that would go hand in hand, basically. Um, so I think those are the clear benefits of asking, is there a way to get things to self-assemble? <laughs> right. And you, you did stop short in a sense. And you said, well, uh, I think I forgot what you actually said, but you said, we're not going to be self-assembling computers, at least not yet. So, um, so what is it that, that makes that not possible now, and and what is it where you kind of hedged a little bit? Um, yeah, I think, do you it's, think it... it's structural. It's structural complexity, right? And so what we're looking at, you know, in, in terms of where I think the, the 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 sort of entry level is for us is to say, you know, I want to create a material with certain functional properties. Okay, so for instance, I want to control how light or heat propagates through a coating. Right. And I want to be able to take, or, or take another example. And I think this is, uh, from, uh, work that uh, you've done in the past, you know, in, in growing, in growing nanoscale structures that are, that are tuned to, uh, to perform better basically because of their structure. So take heterojunction photovoltaics as an example, right? Here's a, when you, when you would grow or others would grow cylinders of silicon from a surface. Mm -hmm. Right, you're controlling two length scales. Then, so if you imagine a pit, you know, that forest of silicon uh, uh, rods coming up and and creating a photovoltaic device, the the two uh, length scales that we're interested in as engineers is the fact that you, by making a forest of those cylinders, you have a large and thick absorption length scale, so you collect a lot of photons. But of course, the, the structure of the cylinder itself, the fact that it has nanometer dimensions in the, in that, in that radial axis allows you to harvest that light more effectively because, because of the, 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 uh, exciton transport, right? That you, you're mm -hmm. close to the junction so that you can actually efficiently separate those charges. There's two key length scales in the, in the photovoltaic problem, right? That can be satisfied by a particular nanoscale structure. And you can design that. You can build that by the sort of top-down methods that we have. But could I make that by a bottom-up self-assembly process of getting those rods to, you know, spontaneously form those forests, uh, align and connect themselves in a way that's going to give me that photovoltaic device? That's, that's, that's the sort of example that's maybe, that's the leading edge, I, I would say, of the kind of what might be, you know, what, what's pushing this sort of idea. Um, and then, but if you think about simpler types of materials that say, okay, well, let me just control the flow of heat, you know, because I have particles organized in a certain lattice, a certain array, so that when phonons come through that material, they scatter off of one another and they interfere constructively or destructively so that they create this band gap, right? They create a, they create a barrier to that phonon transport or even photons. So I create structural color, for instance. Those structures are going to be pretty straightforward to build. 
uh, with a self-assembly process where we get particles to come together in sort of ordered arrays. So those are the sort of targets that I see. They're functional materials, right? They are functional because of their nanoscale structure. Uh, they self-assemble so that they we could we can coat them, we can manufacture them cheaply and rapidly. Um, but you know, if I imagine, and I think you're thinking about this a lot lately, like how do I get transistors to do that? Like how do I make all those really intimate connections that I get in a semiconductor you know, that gives me uh, gates, that gives me you know uh, all the all the, um, the 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 you know 22 nanometer scale transistors that make up my microchips now? I think that's a that's a several orders of magnitude tougher problem to self assemble <laughs> basically. So yeah. I'm gonna start off a little easy. I want to see what I can do with this first before we uh, you know make self assembling computers, which by the way our brain is so it is possible right our whole body is at some level so it's uh but it's that's an interesting point I mean, it's we are at where we are after several decades of exploration because it's hard it's really hard to get uh, matter to go where you want it to and have it be as precise as is needed right for many of the kinds of applications that we're we're talking about um, it would be, I mean, there are examples where people have, have made, um, assembled things that are pretty simple and, and let's, I don't know what to write the a good example is maybe you have one where, you know, the, the, or you don't need much order, right. But, uh, you need something without order, a disordered material, right. And then that, that's okay. We can do that. Right. But when you need control over a uh, position and, uh, maybe that positioning is fairly complex, that's where, you know, we kind of fall on our face as a, a, a community and we keep trying to learn how to do this better, but it, it's just really hard. So one of my examples, uh, you know, I work in an area, I, I work in this area of sort of colloidal assembly we, where we take, you know, micrometer or smaller particles, so hundredth the size of a human hair or smaller, and try to study how they're going to spontaneously form structures that would be functional for these types of applications, how they transport light through them or how they transport heat uh, energy through them, acoustic phonons, for instance. Um, but the other side of my laboratory works in rheology, so how materials flow. And that that the way that we control how materials flow, and this is every consumer product that flows, you know, from your ketchup, right. your foods, right, down to the skin creams that you may or may not use, uh, the shampoos I certainly don't use. Your listeners won't understand that without seeing a photo of me, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll make sure there's a link. But uh, even if the if the product itself doesn't flow it probably flowed at some point during yeah. its manufacturing so exactly and 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 um toothpaste for instance right or paint you know it's those are actually those are our most basic our most simple smart materials when you think about it they flow yeah. when we want them to and they don't when we don't want them to you know the paint flows off the brush uh but it doesn't flow down the wall and we've engineered that property by usually controlling the microstructure or the nanoscale structure of that of that material, that fluid. And that happens a lot by self-assembly of structure. Um, it's not always organized and ordered and, you know, really neat. Um, but, you know, how particles jam together or how they link up together and connect to one another to form percolated structures, those dictate the rheology and especially properties like yield stress. So you can squeeze the toothpaste out of your tube an essential part of using it. However, it will not run off of the bristles on your toothbrush, right? I mean, that's a pretty right. smart material when you really think about it. It's kind of like uh, M&Ms. Uh, maybe that's <laughs> not completely analogous, but they melt in your mouth, not in your hands. That's not a flow issue, I guess. But, uh, well, still... crystallization, it absolutely is, right? Because the material itself is a crystalline solid of yummy, delicious chocolate, <laughs> uh, wax crystals, basically, and, and, other, you know, and, and other components. And, you know, the, the property of that is that it's a solid at room temperature, but you put it in your mouth and it melts. Yeah. So, you know, it's that's another, I guess it's a little bit different control of microstructure, but it's, you know, I mean, those are the types of... Yeah. Yeah. So these things are all hidden around us, basically, right? I mean, we don't really, and that's the thing, and that's what makes this area challenging, I think, especially to communicate, because, um, you know, I've given, I've talked to people before about this sort of self-assembly process, and they say, okay, so, uh, you know, what are you going to sell us? 
Right. You know, like, where's your camera or where's your smartphone or, you know, where's your thermostat that tells the, that knows when you're home or something like that? And you say, you know what? You don't see any of this. It's just around you and it, it gives the function to the material, you know, it gives functional properties to things around us. Um, that, that, that enhances the experience or makes them possible, right? So, you know, whether it's generating electricity by these, uh, maybe self-assembled header junction photovoltaics or, uh, you know, new, new, new technologies, you know, in terms of heat management in your laptop or something like that. So that's one of so, the challenges that it's just like consumer, it's just like the fluids that we, that we use every day. You don't sit there and really ponder about your toothpaste. You're just happy you brush your teeth with it. <laughs> Well, it's 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 interesting because you bring up all these examples that that um, benefit from controlled assembly, as you described. Yet the applications, I think most people on the street would be like, that's that's mundane. Um, and it's, it reminds me of a, one of my favorite quotes by this guy, Mark Weiser. Are you familiar with him? No. He was. Oh shoot, where was he? he was at? Like. Um, xerox or something like that okay um and i'll i'll find a, a link to i think he even has a you know wikipedia page but uh he has this great quote that says uh the most profound technologies are those that disappear they weave themselves into the fabric of everyday life until they are indistinguishable from it which is one of my favorite quotes and it's all the things yeah. you just described are exactly that yeah, I need that because that, that would help me communicate uh, my science and engineering a lot to, to, to people, I think. <laughs> but the other, the other, you know, sort of a similar thing is, um, you know, I was lamenting this one time to some industrial colleagues uh, that, that uh, work for a large, uh, uh, you know, chemical manufacturer, basically. And, you know, they say, oh, we deal with this all the time. You know, this is uh, this is when you just say to people that this is upstream in the value chain. Right. So and that's exactly right, where it right, is. Right? right. And, you know, and, and the example that I, I like to think about as a scientist is the glass that's on our displays right now. And, you know, that's, or there are on our smartphones, this idea that we have these super thin, tough glasses uh, that are, you know, novel materials. I mean, they, they were, you know, they, they were designed and, and implemented, um, you know, these ideas like gorilla glass and things like that. But you don't look at your phone and go, wow, man, that's a great piece of glass. Right. It's just it becomes transparent to the, your experience. It's yeah. a, an enabling technology, basically. Yeah. So. I feel like is there a part of, you know, do people understand what self-assembly is? Uh, do, is it is it is it straightforward to think about, like, you know, what's actually driving us? I mean, the physics of it are so gorgeous and so beautiful. Right. So I would love to hear a, uh, a two minute uh, version of that physics. The, the work that we do, uh, is empowered by the fact that small particles, uh, when I'm, when I'm pretty tiny, you know, on the order of, uh, like I said earlier, a hundredth the size of a human hair or smaller, um, they're macroscopic in terms of their properties. They, 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 they're composed of millions or billions of molecules and, and atoms, uh, but they still experience the random thermal motion of atoms around them or molecules around them. So if we put those particles in, in fluids, they move around by Brownian motion. And the fact that you have particles, so imagine they're like Lego bricks, but that they move around, right, spontaneously. That spontaneous agitation allows them to find uh, essentially configurations, patterns in space that minimize the energy, uh, of, uh, of, of, of the overall suspension. So they can, they can, what's interesting about this, and it's driven by thermodynamics, um, is that, right, you're essentially spontaneously finding new configurations in a way that allows you to form structure, uh, uh, that's gonna minimize what we would say minimize your free energy. And there's, there's bottlenecks to that. There's, there's things that impede that, which become really interesting scientific questions to ask, you know, like when, when does that happen? When can it actually occur that this, uh, that material self-assemble? But that's all we're harnessing. We're just harnessing the fact that our little blocks can move around spontaneously, basically, and so that they can link up with their neighbors in ways that, um, you know, that create these types of, uh, structures that may be useful for us. And they just keep doing it until they find uh, a happy, happy. Uh... What is that, though? You know, it's hard to explain exactly what that right. minima is, like what that really represents. Right. Right. Um, but but, uh, you know, so 
it's for for a lot of times what we're looking for is um, you know when the particles are crowded enough uh, that they they end up they end up finding uh, a spatial pattern which is crystalline right that they they organize themselves into regular arrays across space because that gives every particle a little bit more room to wiggle uh, and so and so we think of that as entropically driven basically self assembly into a crystalline phase which is mm -hmm. kind of it sounds a little bit um unintuitive at first but uh but that's actually you know that's what can happen basically when you take hard particles and you crowd them together they can they can spontaneously form these crystals then as i form we think of them as crystals because you know if you looked at them they would form these patterns regular patterns of particles throughout a three dimensional space and then those Particles then represent little regions, right, where light might scatter off of them uh, in regular arrays or phonons would scatter off of them. So we get the structures that we want to control the properties like heat transport or light transport through our material. So we've kind of talked about self-assembly as something that would be really great if we could do it. It's more or less us waving our hands and getting... Uh, a product, whether it's a transistor or a coating on a window or whatever, a structural material to just form into the thing that gives us valuable properties, good performance, good function. Um, and that's great. That's very Harry Potter at some level. Um, and we've kind of talked about how we're, we're, we're not really close to integrated circuits so we, we can do a few things we can do toothpaste um we can do crystalline <laughs> things uh but the level of complexity isn't uh as as high as we'd like it to be and so i guess we want to talk about a little bit what prevents us from achieving that level of complexity and are there two... fundamental things are there yeah. applied kind of engineering things yeah go ahead i think there's two sides of that i think i mean in my own mind what's the target Right becomes for for one as you organize particles as you create these self assembled structures, novel properties arise. Right, you and so some of these are still open questions about what is possible to create, and we, we don't know. So some of our research, for instance, has been focused on as we make ordered arrays of particles, and and actually we collaborate with a group in in Mainz, uh, George Fitas, uh, at the Max Planck Institute there. Um, who, who really sort of uh, was one of the pioneers of this area, you say, you know, as these small particles organize into lattices, they control how uh, acoustic waves, acoustic phonons propagate through the material. And, and they do it in fairly novel ways. So you're not, you're not really, you know, so on one part, you're getting these self-assembled crystals, and then you're looking at the phononic properties saying, oh, that's really neat and unique. And now it's giving us an engineering, you know, sense of saying, okay, well, that gives us that property. Maybe I can tune or tailor, you know, the particle shape or something like that to give us a different property. So there's a little bit of like, we're still sort of discovering in some ways, you know, where they may, where these types of technologies could apply or where these methods could give us interesting, uh, material properties. The reverse side of that is, I may have target material properties. I want an ultra low thermal conductivity coating or, right, I want something. Mm -hmm. um, what's the structure, right, that, I, that gives rise to that? A lot of times that's empirically driven, right? You know, you just, mm -hmm. you do things numbers of times, whether it's self-assembly or not, until you get something that looks like the target that you have, right? Well, I think we can figure out what structure might be useful. I we're, I think we're better at that, at least, than figuring out how to make that structure. Right, yeah, from, no, I think it, that's and and we it, when you take a step back and you look at it, yeah, right. And so the example of the forest, you know, the heterojunction photovoltaic of the forest of rods is exactly that. It's that as engineers, we can sit there and say, yeah, there's two transport line scales, photon transport and exciton transport, that are dictating an optimal structure. But then the question becomes, well, okay, how do I get that to form? Right? right, and so that inverse process, I think, is uh, wide open at this stage, and I think it's going to require um, a lot more work in terms of figuring out, you know, how we get how we get the forward process, but also a lot more modeling and computational work to help us guide that, right? And say, okay, I can explore around this sort of once we know sort of some of the r rules of this, we can. Uh, get some computation in there to start to help us explore the whole phase space of this process so that we can, you know, really kind of target in uh, the types of particles, you know, the shapes of particles we want, you know, the processes we might need to get them to self-assemble, et cetera. Yeah. 
Um, I had uh, Jim Fentner on several episodes ago. We talked a bit about uh, computational modeling and big data. And, you know, there's this, um, I don't know if it still exists, but uh, there, there's been the MGI, right? The Materials Genome Initiative, yeah, yeah. which has been trying to do at some level that inverse problem, right? Uh, or at least allow us to do the inverse problem. And um, I think it's made a lot of, of headway. And I, I do think where they need to make more headway is in the, now I've told you what structure would be good. Now I'm going to tell you how to make that thing. And I think we're I think that's much more challenging, to be honest. Oh, well, I mean, I think that's I think that's one of the the key targets of where the work should go right now, right? Yeah. Which is, which is giving us that sort of toolbox, that tool set to to do that design problem, basically. Given given a structure, uh, you no, know, we when we were we were looking at some particles that made uh, interesting films that were low thermal conductivity, right? And it. And, you know, maybe there's a potential for a scalable process because it's just a coating, you know, of nanoparticles, basically. At the same time, there's manufacturers out there making turbines, especially as gas uh, turbines become more prominent in electrical generation, right, who want mm -hmm. low thermal conductivity coatings uh, and could benefit from sort of the nanotechnologies that, you know, are starting to come out, uh, you know, in terms of protecting turbine blades. Um, they know the properties that they want. Um, but how do you design a process to actually get that, you know, onto that complex shape or something like that? How do you actually yeah. harness that? So there's, there's this whole series of sort of reverse processes, I think, that, you know, um, that, that could be explored, uh, that, that would drive this, definitely, uh, in my mind. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, that are quite exciting and compelling scientific and engineering problems as well. They, they introduce a whole number of really interesting and beautiful fundamental problems, uh, in addition to, uh, you know, just having a great engineering outcome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I want to ask you about um, kind of the library of, of things we can assemble. I, this is another piece of it that I feel like it's not discussed enough in that we, uh, we, we for by and large, have tried to assemble things that we can make, right? And uh, that makes sense, of course. <laughs> if I have this, I'm going to explore uh, whether... Uh, it assembles. And I feel like another interesting area is how do I design um, the building blocks such they have uh, the right combination of function and, let's say, function and st structure to assemble, if that makes sense. And maybe they're both function at some level. But uh, right, if I want uh, to assemble an array of light absorbers and I need them to be in a particular arrangement, well, I need the thing, the building block, to absorb light. And I also need to have some aspect of that building block that directs the assembly into the structure I want. And I feel like we we haven't done a lot in kind of multifunctionality, right, for property and assembly, if that makes sense. There's pretty cool advances going on right now, though, that okay. allow you— tell me I'm uh, wrong. Well, no, I mean, I don't think you're wrong. I think our work right now is primitive as a community, but it's moving in that direction, right, where— recognition becomes an interesting question, right? So how do I get particles to recognize, you know, other particles uh, or other entities that they want to, you know, basically link up with spontaneously, right? right. And so lock and key types of methods, you know, mm -hmm. do, even just manipulating a shape. So you have, you have, you know, one, one facet fits into, you know, uh, another uh, 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 key like shape or something like that. Um, that's been explored. You know, people have been trying to use DNA All to right. aid that recognition, you know, so that different particles can it just, you, you know, use the recognition properties of the DNA essentially to, to link up. Uh, you know, so, um, there's, there's some advances, uh, along those lines. Um, at the same time, the library of nano, I mean, people that make nanoparticles have just gone bonkers over the past 15 years. And so I think, just the sheer number and um, types of particles that are out there, uh, you know, this is the things that I think about, uh, is just quite exhilarating. And, and many of them with really interesting properties that, you know, again, who sort of knows what happens as you start to, start to assemble them. But, you know, you have plasmonically active nanoparticles, you have uh, phononically active nanoparticles, right? You have uh, photonically active nanoparticles, even quantum dots uh, representing right. that. Um, you know, so... There's, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot there in the mix. Getting it together has been pretty big challenge. Uh, and so I'm not quite sure what the state of the art right now is. I mean, there's a lot of, there, there's, I'm not sure we could, we could really, 
you know, there's been some really neat advances, I think, in terms of recognition. Um, but then, you know, I think when you think about things like how do I get a transistor to form or something like that in solution. Right, right. <laughs> I'm not quite sure, you know, that that's that's still that's still that's still quite an open challenge, basically. Yeah. Um so what industries um or what products um maybe where in the value chain do you think we're going to see the impact of self-assembly first? And so you've talked about a few kinds of assembly processes and toothpaste and paint and such. Um, but in terms of kind of the current science, um, where, where are we going to see an impact in the next 10 years? I think the, the sort of rheology examples are, um, you know, mature and still evolving uh, technologies, right? And and uh, and that's to some extent what inspires, uh, you know, uh, our work in terms of self-assembled materials. Um, the you know, I, I really think you're going to look at you're going to look at advanced materials that give particular properties uh, in terms of you know thermal barriers um, and that sort of thing coming out first, right? Something that's just you know. A great example, I think, is Jim Gilchrist up at Lehigh, you know, where they take uh, just very simple colloidal spheres and, you know, coat them onto surfaces and try to figure out how to do that, you know, as large scale and as defect free as possible. But what those spheres do in a coating, uh, if you put them on an LED, to, an LED lighting system, for instance, is that they act as little lenses and they actually help you couple more light out of the device. Uh, which is typically limited by um, internal reflection types of issues, right? Mm -hmm. So those types of, um, you know, having having materials spontaneously organize that, that, like that, that you can do it inexpensively in large areas, you know, that would th those are really the low hanging fruit, I think, to the to the whole area. I would love to see, um, you know, codable energy harvesting devices. <laughs> that would just right, be right. amazing, right? Uh, that's just so simple to deploy. That said, I mean, I think it's sometimes from material standpoints, we're naive, right? Because there's still module costs and hooking things up and stuff like that. But, <laughs> you know, it's, you know, it's like all the, all the platforms and things like that you have to build. And we may, you know, maybe, maybe it is something as easy as like, you know, you roll out a blanket. At least you can temporarily power something, you know, by solar energy or something like that. And, and to some extent, we have technologies that are starting to look like that, right? I mean, there's thin yeah. film, uh, semiconductor devices and things. Um, you know, but could you do it a much larger scale? Could you do it, you know, much more cheaply? That's, so. that's a great uh, thing you bring up. I, I'm always, um, kind of blown away at the solar industry. And this is as an example where today, the cell is effectively zero cost, right? The thing that does the light absorption, okay, it's a, it's a small contributor to the cost of a panel, but the majority is um, the making of the module, weaving the cells together, putting a frame on your roof, the invert, all these things that aren't the thing that absorbs light. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, you're right that we should all keep that in mind. So, you know, but that's the that's the blind spot of somebody interested in the materials, right? Right. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> but wait, maybe yeah. I can maybe I can just, you know, throw a sheet out the window every once in a while and power my air conditioner. I mean, you know, frankly, my electricity usage is highest, uh, you know, in the summer uh, when I have a lot of light available to me and it's making me really hot. Right. <laughs> so yeah. maybe right. I don't need to deploy it all year round, uh, <laughs> you know, and maybe having something I can just, you know, crank out there and, you know, and it's not that expensive. Uh, you know, so it's got a couple year lifetime, but I can replace it easily. I mean, you know, that could be that could be really cool. Um, Just a warning to anyone who live near Eric: watch out for flying solar cells when you yeah. <laughs> Just fly the flag of solar cell. Uh, you know, I mean, I think those uh, those would be pretty compelling technologies, and uh, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. Maybe as civilization collapses, we can have it power us uh, as we become migratory again. <laughs> Well, okay, so speaking of the collapse of civilization uh, and uh, our, our – which, which I do not endorse in any way. Okay, good, good. Neither do I. I just uh, – it's an interesting point you bring up in the sense that I know your group does work on the International Space Station. So if we destroy Earth, <laughs> and uh -huh. we're all going to go to space, right? So maybe not the end of civilization, but the, the end of Earth, let's say. Um, so talk about this work that you do on the International Space Station and, and why you do it and, and what you are trying to learn from it. 
I've learned I've learned a couple things about space from astronauts. That, <laughs> that I mean, I admire people who will stay in a very small volume of, you know, in a vacuum, two hundred miles above the Earth for six months. I mean, it's uh, and it's that I think. There's no escape in the earth. We have to figure out what's going on. Yeah, no, that's true. In the that's short true. term, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Like if you really think about that, you know, that's it's like eh, it makes you kind of appreciate home a little bit more and want to take care of it. Yes. Um, but that said, okay, so the International Space Station is just this incredible laboratory, you know, that's 200 miles above the earth, circling every hour basically. Um, and it's got a dedicated staff of astronauts that do scientific experiments for people. And we were lucky enough to get an experiment up there studying self-assembly of particles in external fields. This is one way that we can guide particles to form structures. And we were looking for ways of more efficiently getting those structures to form. And especially, uh, there's a scientific question involving, um, there's, 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 there's two competing effects as particles organize. There's the fact that they come together, right? And they crowd one another. And as they crowd one another, they form these beautiful crystalline arrays. But at the same time, as they crowd one another, they lose the inherent ability to move around freely, right? That's giving mm -hmm. them that ability to f explore their configuration spontaneously. So it's the kinetic, you know, effects, the kinetic bottlenecks of self-assembly become things like the glass transition of these particles and, and sometimes gel-like transitions. So we were exploring those sort of bottlenecks. Where the experiments on, so the space station, we took magnetic fields, we were organizing particles in magnetic fields, and um, you know, wonderfully simple experiments that just gave us really rich data in terms of, of abil the ability to circumvent these kinetic bottlenecks. Um, why the space station? It's microgravity. It allows us to do uh, experiments that um, we don't have to worry about matching particles density to the surrounding fluid because everything's, you know, in microgravity basically. So we get just an unperturbed sample floating that allow, you know, in a vessel. Uh, that allows us to study this process with billions of particles, right? So a, a, in a sample volume that's so much larger than we can simulate. So it's still a critical experiment to be able to do to explore this sort of macroscopic self-assembly phase behavior type of problem, uh, you know, with, on time scales that, uh, that, 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 you know, give us the, the insight into these kinetics, basically. Um, so, uh, you know, it's a really, it's a beautiful experiment in terms of fundamentals, um, and, yeah. and sort of understanding these, uh, these fundamental issues of self-assembly. Could you also do it in one of those crazy airplanes that goes like straight up and straight down to that astronaut's the, practice? The, the so-called vomit comet yeah, or the exactly. KC-105 KC or something like that. I forget what it is now. They run an Airbus now, I think, uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, so I, I, you know, we've, I've have, I've friends that have done those and uh, the parabolic oh. flights where they do 30 of them and they don't call it the vomit comet for nothing. Um, <laughs> the, there's that. There's drop towers. That gives you a couple, you know, a, a second or huh. two of microgravity. You know, okay. so typically yeah. with, the, with the parabolic flights, you get on the order, I think, of a minute, maybe a couple, you know, like I think about a minute of, of microgravity. Uh, there's drop towers, there's sounding rockets that people can hmm. send up. You know, there's an emerging space industry that they'll right. be able to throw your experiments up there uh, right. with our ver various private space companies starting up now. The challenge is time scale. So experiments, our experiments take long. Um, uh, they take about an hour. And okay. so, uh, and that's because of the particle sizes that we're using so we can mm. see them and that sort of thing. So, uh, so that makes the the space station the right venue for those experiments. It makes it it gives us the time scale of the experiment that we can that we can do. We can't do it on the parabolic flights or the other methods. Yeah, you bring up a good point about the time scale uh, for the sizes that you're using, right? And that you, earlier, right, you're talking about that these particles are exploring the space around them, and that it's that exploration that allows them to find these low energy structures. But as you know, this goal of building things up ultimately to the macro scale, um, somewhere there's a kind of a cutoff to how rapidly you're going to be able to um, do self-assembly at some level um, in, this, in the sense that we've been describing because stuff is just not going to move as quickly as it gets larger. Yeah, it's all my, it's, in this case, it's because the building blocks we're using are a little bit on the bigger side and that's so that we can see them basically. But, but as, what you really want are, 
much, much smaller particles. And then the time scales become much faster. It goes basically as the particle size, uh, the volume of the particle, uh, in some, in, in some fashion. So, uh, so, well, okay, that's not entirely true, but, uh, basically it's dependent on the particle size. And so as I go to nanometer scale particles, uh, tens of nanometer scale particles, the, the processes become quite a bit more rapid. Um, but they also become, you know, so what we're trying to do is understand the process. Right. So we need, we want to, we want to work on time scales that are easily observable. You know, mm-hmm. it's an hour with transitions over minutes and, yep. uh, you know, so that we can video, we can record it on video. We can see it with a light microscope. Those are the types of things that we're trying to satisfy with the experiment. Um, but, but you're right, right? So, you know, uh, the, the, that time scale wouldn't be very efficient for creating a, creating a, creating a functional material where I'm trying to make a lot of it, right? You know, what well, takes an hour to self-assemble, you know, a couple millimeters of fluid. Uh, that's not, that's not going to work. Um, right. but, but I think those time scales will shorten as, as we go to the, the, the truly functional materials. I think it's probably also going to be, There'll be different things we'll do at different length scales, right? There'll be different processes that you know, as you oh, build absolutely. up, right, from the nano yeah, yeah. to the macro, you'll do kind of self-assembly for a couple length scales. And then as you get big enough to manipulate something, it, maybe we won't need self-assembly and we can use other technologies to go the next step, right? And that's a really neat point because I think, you know, in some ways there's this mesoscale problem that people talk about. And actually, you know, what we're dealing with sort of bridges that. Um, yeah. But then there's, yeah, there, there's a macro scale, right? There's a, there's a physical coding process, for instance, or there's a, you know, I mean, there's, 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 there's large things being manipulated right? Yeah, right, right. Uh, onto substrates and then those exactly. substrates are moved. And so, yeah, yeah th- that, and we're not, you know, Maybe maybe new efforts in manufacturing and things like that are going to be able to explore those connections and make them a little bit more seamless. Um, you know, certainly when you visit your industrial collaborators or when you visit people in industry, you know, they do worry and they do think about that and they do have the teams that help them bridge those types of things. Um, but in academia, we don't, you know, we oftentimes we just pull off a nugget of it and we don't get to really explore the whole whole of that space. It's a good point. I mean, from a how, how do you try and write a proposal for a big center? And this is an interesting question of, of how you go all the way from a nanoscale building block to a macroscale product. Um, and I'm reminded of DARPA had this program called Atoms to Products, where they were trying to start getting people thinking about what would you do as you transition from these different length scales and what processes make sense at each step and where do you draw the cutoff and, and where do you... I mean, do the transition, right? And it's probably application dependent. Uh, but the, those are, I think, are really interesting questions. And, and ultimately, for nanomaterials uh, or even some of these micromaterials to be useful in, as we go forward, I think we're going to have to figure out more how to do that, that interfacing of length scales. Yeah, I think there's a processing, right? And processing yeah. science that, that, you know, that, that's, that's sort of that more manufacturing centered side of things. Um, you know, we, 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 as, as science and engineering geeks, sometimes we like our esoteric fundamental problems and like to peer down at the smallest levels and maybe turn up our nose sometimes when you're actually pulling it through an extruder or something like that. <laughs> but that's essential, right? It's essential yeah, sure. to connecting it to the applications. And of there's course. a lot that happens in that too. So that's an exciting area. You know, I think, I think it's a place where it can be multidisciplinary and, um, you know, that's where the, a lot of the innovations will eventually come from. So you have to go. I know we have you for a little bit of time. Um, I want to ask you one more question. Sure uh, thing. Kind of a general question. I'm, I'm curious if you could describe for people, what is it about uh, the craft of science and engineering that you like? What is it about doing science engineering on a daily basis that attracts you to the discipline, the field? Oh, it's the, it's the puzzle. It's, the, it's just the puzzles. Just the, yeah. the impossible number of puzzles that you get to solve every day. I'm not a crossword guy. I'm not a like, <laughs> you know, I don't like, I don't like, I don't like puzzle games because my entire job is a series of puzzles. And, the, and when, and, and not just be, you know, not yeah. like deep puzzles though too. Yeah. And, you know, and, and the, the feeling that you get when you solve those puzzles, when you peer into something for the first time, when everything starts to lock into place and you go, Oh, I understand that. 
you know, there is nothing like that feeling. And, you know, it doesn't happen every day, right? We know that it happens no. like it, it happens maybe once a year or a couple right. of times a year, but you get those insights, right? And yeah. you just go and you peer into the beauty of nature, right? And you're just, it's just there. And, and it may be a place where you've been the only human being that has ever thought that or ever seen that, you know, and it can be small. Most of us, uh, I think I see very small things typically, but you know, when it, when it fits together and then you get to share that, uh, you know, that's, that's really the thing that's just so much fun about science and engineering. And I would argue the, the, um, the, the, when you're at that point, then pretty quickly you start to think, what's the next question I can oh, ask? Oh yeah, of course. Right. <laughs> and you know, but, but there's a this beautiful book called Ignorance. Um, Stuart oh. Fire, Firestein, is that right? Um, uh, he teaches at Columbia University, and and he really points out nicely that science is not the enterprise of accumulating knowledge; it's the right. enterprise of accumulating ignorance. And and yeah. it's the it's what we're doing is we're we're pushing back on that boundary all the time, trying to figure out where it is and how we and how we can manipulate it. And, and when we as scientists and engineers are always asking what we don't know, right? And and it's a humbling experience overall, right? When mm -hmm. you when you spend the entire day thinking about how ignorant you are. <laughs> I'm so ignorant. So. But, you have no idea, you know, Eric. Oh man. I'm 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 at least twice as ignorant as you, Mike, so <laughs> <laughs> That actually might sound good on my resume now. So <laughs> at any rate, um, but those are the things that really yeah. attract me. And I think, you know, and when you get to share that with students and you get to share that with the undergraduates and even the high school students that come into your laboratories and, and the research students, the graduate students, the postdocs, you know, that endeavor is really, I think, what brings you in every day and, and thinking about the, you know, the types of the, the, the types of things that you're going to do. Eric, first, thank you so much for taking a few minutes. Thanks, Mike. You've been listening to Nanovation. If you enjoyed the show, please leave a rating or write a review on Apple Podcasts. Show notes are available at fillerlab.com forward slash nanovation. Nanovation is recorded in the Marcus Nanotechnology Building on the campus of Georgia Tech. Andrew Cannon edits the show. I'm Mike Filler. See you next time.